up to the year 2000 or so, software was developed using structured or staged approaches, often called waterfall. Testing was planned and executed in stages too, to fit uh, those processes. And the classic texts on testing from the 70s, 80s and 90s were dominated by definitions of these various stages of testing. But since uh, the late 1990s, early 2000s or so, waterfall approaches have lost favour as Agile has gained popularity. Now, many companies use Agile methods, but testing is often still performed in stages. Now, the reasons for testing in stages have not changed because Agile is now part of the game. Many companies are increasingly using continuous delivery of small increments, and even so, testing is still done in stages, whether it's automated or manual. It's still the rule. So let's look at why that is and examine the factors that influence the definition of test stages in your test strategy. Before I start, I just want to uh, suggest what other words or phrases are used to define test stages. Uh, they're also known as test phases, uh, test levels I've seen. Uh, more recently, test sub-process has been used. A, a stage is part of a larger test process, so a sub-process. Sub uh, but I've also seen them called test types, which is, I think it's terrible. Uh, and test task, but that doesn't sound uh, terribly useful. Whatever, I'm going to use the term test stage in this video. Now, I just want to do a little bit of background and probably ancient history to just describe why stages exist. Typically, we build bigger systems from smaller components. Um, and it makes a lot of sense to test these components first before we assemble them into larger systems and then test complete systems. With components, it's easier to test, to diagnose failure, to debug, to fix, to release and retest quickly. And in modern uh, software development, uh, the speed of uh, the turnaround of uh, testing and changes is it's critical to success. But once trusted, when we've tested our components, we can reuse them and trust them in larger assemblies, larger subsystems and the complete system. So we tend to build software from the bottom up. Uh, and you could identify some obvious uh, stages of testing that map to this process of assembly, uh, creation and assembly. Uh, we create small com components and we test those. We integrate those tested components to subsystems and we test those subsystems. We can integrate those tested subsystems to a complete system and test the complete system. And we can integrate those systems with other systems uh, and test uh, a, a collection of systems. Now we might vary the build sequence depending on the architecture that we're uh, building to. Uh, but it also depends on other uh, matters. And it depends on how we want to test and what goals we have and what risks we're trying to address. Now, a bit of ancient history. Uh, again, this concept of uh, building uh, from components through to the complete system. Uh, the V model was very popular, in the, I think invented in the 70s, you know, not long after the whole waterfall idea became uh, the current way of, of, uh, of building systems. Uh, but the V model basically said two, a couple of things. One was that we use the requirements on the left, the requirements, the specifications, designs on the left to test uh, at the appropriate level on the right. Now, this all sounds great in print in theory, but in practice, the time between the definition of requirements on the left and the users actually getting their hands on the software on the right is as as, as great as it could be in a project. Requirements come at the very start and user acceptance at the very end. So Waterfall let us down in many ways because it doesn't reflect the whole learning process of building systems uh, across a life cycle. And the other angle with this is 
there's never a one-to-one -one relationship between the documents on the left and the testing on the right. Uh, when I was working primarily in uh, waterfall projects in the 90s, um, we always felt that we had to use multiple documents, you know, the requirements and the designs and specifications together to understand what we should be testing against. And there's also no mention of what you might call static testing, reviews, inspections, static analysis of code uh, in the V model. And nowadays the whole shift left idea uh, encourages testers to get involved earlier to test requirements and designs. So uh, my colleague, uh, Paul Herslick, uh, 30 years ago, um, came up with this thing called the W model, which is really two Vs, uh, you could say, but the first V in blue uh, represents the deliverables. You know, we write and deliver some requirements. We specify the system, we create a system spec. We create a design, we write code, we build software subsystems, we build a complete system, we install the system in an environment and integrate it with other systems. So the blue blobs, let's call them, uh, represent the deliverables. And the second V in green represents the test activities associated with each of those deliverables. So testing through the life cycle really does begin with the earliest deliverables such as requirements and uh, system designs. So the W model basically encourages the shift left idea, but also extends uh, testing from uh, more than just the dynamic testing on the right hand side. We test everything that is significant in the success, uh, potential success or failure of our system. Now coming a bit more up to date, um, there's been a, a steady move towards uh, more agile methods and uh, again, uh, an encouragement by a lot of uh, companies to move towards continuous delivery. And I'm not gonna talk about continuous delivery for very long, but in effect, we're replacing long staged projects with a very rapid and continuous delivery of small increments of functionality in what you might call micro projects or sprints are obviously uh, a way of looking at it nowadays. So if we look at continuous delivery from the perspective of is there a staged process? Well, there still kind of is. There still is a, uh, a requirements analysis and design activity. There's some build and testing activity. And then there's a release and operation activity. There is still a staged uh, uh, process in there. But continuous delivery is helpful because we're making many smaller, less risky configuration changes, uh, developments and increments uh, of, of functionality. And because they are smaller and less ambitious, let's say, they're easier to implement, deploy and test. So we can convert from a, a project that delivers its deliverables in large chunks to a project that delivers many more rapid iterations uh, and smaller scope and smaller scale uh, uh, iterations. Now, in order to achieve this and to keep pace with the rapidity or the cadence of, of the development, testing and implementation, um, we have to adopt a more pervasive automation strategy. So regression testing you know, of every, every deliverable is part of the process. Uh, our environments, uh, database application builds, unit and integration tests and so on are all automated. And configuration and the testing has to fit the automated continuous delivery pipeline. Now, there's not much room for manual testing in that process. So uh, if there is any uh, user or acceptance testing that might be uh, of a more manual nature, it tends to be tacked on, on at the end. But the pipeline itself is as automated as we can make it. Now, there still is a... Uh, notion of stages, even if we move to a continuous delivery or what's more recently being called DevOps. Uh, the DevOps process is often described by this kind of infinite, infinity uh, loop, if you like. But uh, to be honest, if you look at it a bit more closely and unwrap it, it's still a staged process. So even the most modern environments have a series of change, 
uh, stages which we iterate through very rapidly, maybe uh, on a weekly or even a daily basis in some places. So it's still, you could say, a staged or structured uh, process. Uh, one last uh, model uh, that I want to introduce is, uh, you may have seen uh, the test automation pyramid where if we're moving towards a more agile and a uh, more automated and continuous delivery environment, um, the bulk of testing is going to be automated for a start um, and the majority of tests are going to be developer or unit or component tests. Uh, acceptance tests might look at integration aspects, the API layer, if you like, and the GUI tests are in a minority. I mean, they're hard to get working and don't always give us a lot of value. Manual testing is still there, but it's definitely in a minority. Well, I have to say that this is very reminiscent of the V model. So even, even though uh, we're moving towards more agile and more continuous uh, mechanisms to deliver software, there's still a staged uh, aspect to the testing we do on the right hand side of the V model or uh, in the uh, automated pipeline that for continuous delivery. So how do we define uh, test stages in our strategy? Uh, again, I'm, it's going to sound like I'm talking about larger projects and larger project projects very definitely have a staged test process. So even in smaller uh, agile continuous delivery projects, there's a staged aspect to the testing that takes place towards the end of a cycle of development. Well, there are at least seven uh, aspects that uh, affect how we define uh, test, our test stages that drive the need for stage testing towards the end. Now, the stages might be uh, very closely knit and integrated, if you like, into an automation regime. But even so, the, the, the nature of the stages is driven by these seven factors I've got here. And there's probably a couple more that we could, we could talk about too. But let's look at these quickly. The first one is, what is the baseline we're testing against? Are we using uh, requirements documents, traditional or user stories or some other form of specification? Um, that usually defines a scope of testing for a stage of testing. As we progress through tests, the, the goals and risks that we're considering in developer testing and in test-driven development, perhaps, are quite different from integration, system level and user acceptance testing. So we have these notion of goals which, which uh, evolve over the process. Who performs the testing might also drive the need for having a staged process. So developers clearly do developer testing, that's for sure. But integration testing is often a technical uh, activity, but it could involve testers too. Uh, acceptance testing tends to be done by users if, if it's about the user interface and end-to-end uh, -end testing, let's say. But it might be done by an external agency, a services company. It might be done by the supplier. It might be done by just an offshore company who take on some of the stages of testing. The degree of automation also affects uh, what goes on in each of these test stages. Again, if it's fully automated, well, clearly we're doing regression testing primarily, but there must be some manual testing before that regression testing happens because we tend to have to debug our automated tests by running the tests manually in the first instance. So the automation uh, uh, coverage, if you like, through the process also affects what goes on in each test stage. Inevitably, we need environments to host the testing in these various stages. And in large complex systems, environments become, even with uh, cloud and uh, virtualization, they become a very complex logistical uh, challenge to deliver and to maintain them and, and make them available, but also to make them suitable for the testing we're trying to implement. Test data, as always, is a, an issue with the testing we want to do. Uh, within the developer kind of uh, testing, the data tends to be very localized to the process that a component is, is operating it, if you like where we go to system and integrate large-scale integration and uh, acceptance testing, we tend to want more realistic data that 
might well be a copy of some live data. It might be scrambled uh, or anonymized, uh, of course, but even so, it's a complex thing to get a test database together for the later stages of testing. Now, another aspect of this, again, probably in larger projects, uh, the contract that uh, is held between a customer of a system and the developer, uh, the system integrator who are building and implementing a system, the contract itself might state this, what the test process actually looks like. There might be a, a series of stages and each stage, the, the, the successful completion of each test stage might trigger a stage payment. This is how the supplier gets paid for their work. So. The, these stages themselves will almost certainly have very specific uh, goals, coverage targets, um, the risks to be addressed, and they will require their own environment and different people might well be uh, uh, executing the tests in each of these stages. So the contract itself between supplier and customer might drive the need for test stages. So I want to suggest all projects have some notion of test stages to varying degree. Large projects, very clearly, this is what the way it works. For smaller projects, there's a notion of, of test stages, but they might be quite closely uh, integrated. Even smaller agile projects have developer testing, testing performed by the tester in the team, or testing performed by users. And automation might be used at various stages.